Yes, recording. And Dennis, give you this virtual microphone and wish you a great meeting today. Okay. Um, so um, we'll start with a little introduction of who we are uh, so that everyone is uh, on track and, know, and knows who is talking to them. Um, so we've uh, collected a series of topics uh, around uh, JavaScript and called it a night with JavaScript, which is what it is, it's night. Uh, <laughs> so there we go. Um, first about us. Um, so uh, my colleague on my right, which is here, um, is Katya. Uh, she is uh, one of our developers uh, one of our more creative developers. Um, then uh, uh, opposite to me uh, is Eben. Uh, he is a lot of things and also a developer. Um, and last uh, but not least, uh, I am Denis, uh, and I am uh, also a developer and team manager at Studio Hype Dread. Um, I'll give a short introduction about who we are, uh, just so uh, you know uh, who we are um, as a company. And then we'll move to uh, Eben's uh, talk, which is the first, first one of this uh, night. So um, who is Studio Hyperdrive? Uh, we are uh, an agency from Belgium uh, that is focused on durable digital growth, uh, which means that we help companies with strategy, research, analysis, um, design, development, interaction, uh, anything you can think of, and we try to build it or uh, make it happen. Uh, we have several uh, different things that we do as a service. Uh, we do websites, web apps, uh, mobile applications, digital experiences, business engines, and consulting services. So uh, I think that's everything that we can offer <laughs> or that anyone can offer. Um, we are with 45 uh, at this moment, or give or take one, because we've uh, recently uh, added a few people to our team, so <laughs> I can't keep up with the number anymore, uh, but we're still uh, more or less the same group of people uh, as we were four years ago when we started. Uh, we just added a lot more talent and cool people uh, to build cool stuff with. Um, so we have this cool picture of us uh, on a team building last year. There you go. Uh, looks like we're into sports, but I don't think that's, uh, that's really true. Um, and we've worked for clients like Nike, McDonald's, uh, Stad Antwerpen, which is a city in Belgium, and the government of Flanders, which is, uh, is a part of Belgium. Um, our goal today, the most important thing, um, we have selected three topics we wanted to share uh, some uh, knowledge uh, of. Uh, the first one being RxJS, which my colleague Eben will uh, talk about. Then we'll move on to uh, GraphQL, uh, which I will talk about. And last but not least, uh, Katya will share some knowledge about Cyprus. Um, we've made sure that all our talks are at an entry level. Um, so for the more uh, advanced people, it might be a bit too basic, but we wanted to make sure that everyone uh, was able to follow, uh, given that you have a positive attitude and some basic JavaScript knowledge, uh, you'll be good to go with our talks. So that's the introduction, and I'll now give the words uh, end screen to Eben, um, if I can find the button <laughs> for uh, Zoom. Yeah, okay, there we go. All right, I assume that everyone can hear me and see me, and um, yes, my... Uh, sound is on. All right, so I'm going to start with a talk about RxJS, and it's called Say Yes to RxJS, and it, we were going to do that because all the cool kids are streaming right now. Um, before we get started and we talk about RxJS, I'm going to start with a little bit in, of information about myself, so you at least know who's talking to you. My name is Eben. I am a front-end developer. I've been working as a front-end developer for about six years now, so this summer will be the sixth year of my employment. I started in a smaller company, moved to a bigger one, and tomorrow I'll be working at Studio Hyperdrive for an entire year. So that's really cool. Um, throughout the past six years, I've basically exclusively worked in Angular, which means that I'm pretty much an Angular expert. The 
because of that, I started with AngularJS and transferred to Angular when it actually was production ready and never looked back. Um, it's one of the most amazing frameworks ever in my mind and in my opinion. And, and anyone who is working as a web developer, I will always say, try Angular, it's amazing. Um, and sometimes looks can be deceiving and it might seem, uh, but in this case, that's not the case. I know that I have a very uh, artistic look. Um, that's because uh, outside of the technical aspect, outside of my developer life, I am also an artist. I'm a singer songwriter. I'm a poet. I uh, do 3D modeling. I do all kinds of creative stuff because the technical side is cool, but I also really like to be creative. Now that's enough about me. You wanted to know about RxJS and not about this guy with a mustache. So we're going to dive right in. Um, we're going to start with what RxJS is. Um, we're going to talk about observables. So I'm going to talk about operators, custom operators, and some closing thoughts on the entire talk about RxJS. Now let's start with the thing you all came for. What the hell is RxJS? RxJS is a web development library that is used for event-driven flows, which means that it's a library, so it can be used with other libraries, so, such as React. It can also use, be used in bigger frameworks, such as Angular. So it's independent of several other libraries. You can just use it with them. Um, in short, RxJS allows us to write reactive code. Um, throughout the life cycle of an entire application, there are always certain amount of events, click events, API events, um, timers, and RxJS simply allows us to anticipate those events and then respond to those events. And that makes, us, makes it really easy for us to work in a reactive way. Um, we're going to start with a very simple example to give an idea of what RxJS is. And that simple example is a click event. Um, we, are all, we are all developers. So all of us will eventually have to face the wrath of the users. And what do users do? They click on stuff. So um, we have click events that we need to uh, register and we need to listen to. Um, the moment we have a click event, we start, we change our flow of our application from a synchronous flow, a flow that goes step by step. So your code just does one thing, does the other thing, does the next thing, and we move into an asynchronous flow because at that point we need to wait and we need to listen to the input of something else. And in this case, it's our user. So let's take this simple example. In the normal way of handling click events, we simply add an event listener to our document. We say that we'll uh, listen to the click and every time we click, we'll log that the user has clicked. That's how we usually do it. Um, and now I'm gonna show you how you do it with RxJS. So with RxJS, we import from events operator, and now we will make an observable out of this um, click uh, function. And we do this by grabbing an, ele an element on the DOM, which is in this case, a button, and we'll listen to the click event on that button. So this is already a lot of technical mumbo jumbo and I'm going to dive into each of, each of these little things. So at the end of the talk, you'll understand what happens here and what it all does. So this brings us right into observables. Observables are the core principle behind RxJS and it's the thing that you really need to wrap your head around in order to understand it and in order to really get what happens. So an observable is a stream or a source of data that will emit over time. Um, that's a very difficult concept to wrap your head around. So I'm going to try to visualize that as much as possible throughout this um, presentation so that you have a visual clue of what actually happens. So we started and we made, in the previous slide, we made a, a my observable. So I'll constantly refer back to that my observable. So we created a my observable and the my observable will listen to when you click on the document. So when you click anywhere on your web application. So I assume, as I said, an observable is a stream, is a data collection that will emit over time. I assume that if I click, I will see this click somewhere on a stream. So let's do this, I'll click. Now I clicked, but nothing happened. And the reason for that is because the stream doesn't initiate, initiate, initiate until the moment I start listening to the screen. To set an observable in motion, we need a subscriber. You can basically compare that with a faucet. Um, if you 
Don't do anything to your faucet. No water will come out. If you turn it open, the water will come out. So that's kind of the same idea with subscribers and observables. The moment you start listening to an observable, there will actually start things. The stream will actually start and you can start listening to them. You can do that by calling the subscribe method on the observable. So let's show that in a visual way, make it more um, to make it easier to understand. We have our my observable, we start to subscribe. And from now on, we have an actual stream where we can actually see things on. We made an observable that listened to click events on the DOM. So every time I click, one of the events will be shown right on the stream. And that's in a nutshell, the beginning. That's an observable that allows us to listen to um, events on the stream. That's the very bare bone basics. Of course, we don't want to stop at just listening at um, events on a stream. We want to do things with events because if we are just listening to them, then we're basically doing nothing. So we're going to use callbacks in our subscribed so that we can actually start doing things with those events. And we're going to get, we are again going to go back to our example. We'll take a look at it and see how that works. So we have my observable, the one that listens to clicks on the document. We start to subscribe, and this time around, I passed a function to the subscribe, a callback, that will do a very simple thing. In this case, I used an arrow function so that I can easily do that. That's my preferred method of working. And somewhere in my code, I defined an index that I will now increase with every button click that I do. Every time I click, I will also log in the console, the console that I clicked and I will send that index with it so that I always can see how many times that I clicked. So I click once and I get click one. I click a second time, I click get click two. And of course, if I click a third time, I'll get click three. And that's basically how we do, how we actually do something with our observables. We can actually start doing stuff with the event. So from, from at this point, you know how to listen to an observable and you know how to do things with the events on an observable. Now, subscriptions will always keep existing until we explicitly tell them to stop. That's one of the most important things to keep in mind, especially when you start with RxDS. A lot of developers forget that and all of a sudden they will say, oh, my web application is super slow or certain things are happening, certain callbacks are being called when I don't want them to, how do I fix this? Well, once we subscribe to an observable, that subscription will keep running until we refresh our application. In most cases, we don't want to refresh our application. We want our application to keep living. So we'll have to manually stop the subscription. Now, how do we do that? We'll again go to the visual because that's easier to explain. We have our My Observable, we start subscribing, and we can essentially assign the subscription that we create with the subscribe method to a variable. That makes it easier for us to then later on stop the subscription. Again, it's the same example. I click once, I click I get the click event, click another time, get another click event, and then I say subscription.unsubscribe. From there on out, my subscription stops, and I will no longer be able to listen to the event. Again, this is a super important step because if you don't do these things, you don't think about that, these subscriptions will keep on living and it will make it, it will make your application slower. It will constantly do callbacks when you actually don't need it to do anymore. And sometimes that even leads to ghost data or things that just happen when you don't really know why. So usually when you start with RxJS and something like that happens, you notice that your application goes slow. There are things that are happening that you're not supposed to. Always check if you haven't got any subscriptions running at that point. Um, we can also subscribe to observables more than once. We can essentially in any given time in the life cycle of our application, we can subscribe to an observable. We then start listening to that stream from that moment on. And that's a very important distinction um, which is going to be much easier to understand if I show you a visual for that. So again, my observable, I subscribe. That means that my stream gets started and I click once and I click a second time. But now I want to subscribe to that observable again, um, a separate subscription. When I do that, I get another stream. If I now click a third time, I will get both events. I will get it on my first subscription and I'll get it on my second subscription. From here on out, um, 
I will try to answer the questions at the end of the uh, presentation, but I'll keep it in mind. Yeah, exactly. That's correct. Um, so with observables, we can listen to the stream, but that also means that we can only listen to the stream. That means that we cannot put things on the stream ourselves, which means we cannot directly put data or events on streams. We usually do that usually happens when, um, for instance, if you click and you were listening to click events, then the click is going to be put on the stream, but you don't put it on the stream yourself. Same goes for an API call, a timer. You never put things on the stream yourself. You only listen to the stream. It's an important distinction, and it's something a lot of people struggle with at the beginning because they are like, yeah, okay, but now I have 15 events, and I want to push an event of my, my own. That's not possible. You can't do that with an observable. And now the fun begins. You start, you understand observables, you know how it works. So now you want to do stuff with it. And of course, there are a bunch of tools for you so that, that you can easily start doing things um, and start to be able to handle certain use cases. Let's get started about operators. Operators can either be creation operators or pipeable operators. Creation operators allow us to create observables. Pipeable operators allow us to manipulate the streams. Creation or combine, combination operators, as I said, can make um, new observables, and it can do that by using events in the DOM, um, API calls, or for instance, combining certain other observables. When we use a pipeable operator, we start to manipulate um, all kinds of stuff on the stream. We'll start with the easiest one of the two, creation operators. And as I said, those allow us to create observables from a source. We've already used one of those, and that's the from event operator. We use that operator to change the listener to the document and change that and bring that into an observable. So an operator like from event allows us to create observables from events. There are also other types of creation operators, for instance, off and from. I'm not gonna dive into those here in this presentation. The best thing to do is know that those exist. And once you need them, go into the documentation and you'll find much more about it. And they will explain it in a much better way than I will ever be able to. Um, on the other hand, there's also another type of creation operators, and those are combination operators. And that essentially allows us to combine multiple observables into a single observable. At this point in time, that might sound weird, but later on in the presentation, I will give an example of this and how that is some a use case that's actually quite common in your day-to-day -day programming in a um, application. So here's an actual example of a combinable operator. Uh, combination operator, and this is the combine latest. It essentially takes multiple observables all in an array, and every time one of those observables emits an event, we will get all the events, um, we'll get the latest event from each observable. As you can see, we made an array or a list of observables, my observable, my second observable, and every time one of these observables emits an event, We'll get a new event here on our stream and in our subscription with the latest value from each observable. So if my observable emits, then I will get the recent the new event from my observable. And from the second observable, we'll get the latest one that was emitted. So if my observable emits now and my second observable emitted two minutes ago, it will always get the value from now from observable one and the value from two minutes ago from observable two. And we can do all kinds of things with those um, observables. So that allows us to combine multiple observables into one, and that's really useful for certain use cases. And I'll give an example of that use case later on in the presentation. Um, pipeable operators allow us to manipulate um, the stream, which means that we can actually start doing things with the data on the stream. With pipeable operators, we can perform actions on every value in the stream, 
like machines on a conveyor belt. And I like to use that as an example because it's a really visual example and it allows us to really understand it. Essentially, imagine if your uh, observable is a small machine that generates chocolate X and you have a conveyor belt with three different machines on the conveyor belt. The first machine will check if the chocolate egg is in a good condition. The second one will wrap it in some wrapping paper. The last machine will uh, stamp a sticker on it so that you know it's uh, Studio Hyperdrive chocolate egg. So essentially operators are the same things as the machines on the conveyor belt. They will filter out things from um, our, our stream. So the first machine would filter out the bad eggs. Um, we'll have transformations. The second machine and the third machine, they will, they will change the egg. They will wrap it in some wrapping paper. They will put on a logo. So things like that. Um, we group all of these operators in a pipe function, which will ensure that each operator is run for each value on the stream. So essentially, that's on our conveyor belt. Make sure that every time a chocolate egg passes, it passes each, um, each single one of the machines we're onto. All operators in the pipe function will be run, run consecutively for each value that is emitted on the stream. So a lot of technical talk. Let's go back to a visual so it's easier to understand. I'll use my, uh, my click observable again. So if we wouldn't be using a palpable operator, this is what would happen. We subscribe, we generate a stream, we click once, we click a second time, we click a third time. All good and well, we can't re -under re understand. In this example, we know it by now. But what if I introduce a pipeable operator here, like a map function? It's, very, it's a very simple um, uh, pipeable operator. It's a simple map uh, operator. What it does, it takes the value that it gets from the stream and it will map it to uh, or transform it to another value. In this case, I don't even care about whatever the value is that enters the stream. I simply return the letter A. So if I would have clicked three times now with this map operator, what would happen is I would essentially get the letter, the letter A three times. And that is how um, pipeable operators and work in RxJS. They can, for instance, transform our events into something else, which is a very common use case. There are a multitude of different categories of pipeable operators. On one hand, you have transformation um, operators. That's, for instance, like the wrapping machine or the machine that puts a stamp on the chocolate egg. Those are transformations because they take the current value and change it into something else. We have a filter operator that will check, like the first machi machine that checked if, it, if we had the good egg or bad egg and stuff like that. There are also a multitude of other um, categories. We've got uh, operators to help us with um, simple tasks. We have operators that will help us with error flows and all kinds of stuff, but we're not going to go into that right now. Um, the transformation and the filter operators are the ones you're gonna be using the most anyway. Um, so a transformation operator, simply as the name says, it transforms value on a stream. And just like before, we've actually already used one, the map operator. The map operator allows us to change an incoming value of an observable to a new observable. There are plenty of other ones you've got, had. You have switch maps, you have scans, you have merge maps. But again, you'll need those when you need them. And when you do need them, you'll, uh, you'll, the best thing to do is just look into the, into the documentation. I have to do it every time as well. Because even though I know these ones exist, the ones that I use a lot, I know, but the other ones I just have to look up because I am not a perfect being and I can't remember everything. Um, filter operators, on the other hand, are like the first machine on our conveyor belt that will check if it's a good egg or if it's a bad egg. If it's a bad egg, we don't want to wrap it and we don't want to put a sticker on it because we don't want to sell bad eggs to people. So the filter operators filters out values on a stream. I'll use an example for this one again, because it's easier to understand it. Um, but one of the most simple um, filter operators is for instance, the first operator. Um, the first operator makes sure that we only get the first event that's ever emitted on the uh, stream. From then on out, we don't want to hear anything. We don't care about the other events. For instance, in this case, I would only want to listen to the first click after that, I never want to listen to the other clicks anymore. So what happens is the moment I subscribe, I create my stream, I create, I get my first event, 
but because of the first operator, if there are other events, if I keep um, if I keep um, clicking, nothing will happen. All right. So in short, for quite a lot of use cases, we have operators to help us. Essentially, uh, our XCS operators, you can look at them at the same way as you can look at uh, helper functions in Lodash or Ramda or um, helper functions on arrays. There are basically a bunch of tools that allow you to do specific use cases. And these use cases are often the use cases a lot of us use on a daily basis. Um, there are multiple great forms of documentation. My personal favorite is uh, learn, learnrxjs.io. One of the participants in the chat tonight um, suggested it to me, and I'm super happy with that because it has a bunch of examples and it always shows you like a simple example and then it shows more, diff more difficult examples. So that's easy here to understand. And most importantly, it also shows you some related um stuff so that you know like okay i have a map but i need it in a specific function and sometimes in the related recipes it will tell you okay but maybe you should use this operator instead because it's a better operator for the thing you want to do so if you ever want to learn about the uh, operators learn is my favorite website but there is a bunch of websites you can use i'm gonna take a sip of water first because i've been talking way too much already um, but what if I have a special use case? Of course, nobody can make every use case. And sometimes you have special use cases that you yourself need a lot of the time, but someone else hasn't made it for you. Well, that's no big problem because for custom use cases, we can simply make our own custom operators. Super easy, super useful. And we're going to do two of them right now because two, these two are the ones that I use the most and are usually the first that I enter in a new project I'm working on. A common use case is mapping values of an array. We can make our own map array operator to speed up our workflow. A regular map operator will get the value and will transform the value into something else. So if the observable has an array, we'll get an array and on that array, we'll have to call the arrays map function to map the values of the array. If you can already hear me talking about that, you can already hear that that's a lot of steps. And if we have to do that for every single time we need to map values of an array of an observable, that's going to be a lot of work and that's gonna take a lot of time to, um, to type. So what if we make an operator so that we can directly map the values of the array in a single operator? Well, we'll look at, we'll look at that right now. We'll make a custom operator and it looks like a lot of code here. And that's because I use TypeScript. So I type everything, um, but it's actually a lot more simple than you think. First of all, we can make custom operators by simply making functions make a function map array and I essentially gave um, two interfaces to my function the interface of the current values of the uh, array and an interface for what I want to have in the array um, this then I will pass a convert function to my um, uh, custom pipeable operator so that I can pass that function to my eventual array so I can easily start mapping those values. Then I say that the result that I want is an operator function and I start with my original typed array and I want my result typed array. So what I simply do is I reuse the existing map operator from RxJS and use that to turn it into a new operator. And usually that's all you have to do to make your own custom operators. You can basically use the ones that you already have and you, could, you can put in some code so that you don't have to repeat that code over and over and over again. So in this case, I get an array, which is my result and I return that result and I simply do my map function on which I perform my convert function. This already looks like a lot of code. So what does it look like when I actually implement this on an array, an observable array? Well, here I have an observable array I have an observable with a number array. So I have a bunch of numbers and an array and I want to multiply them by two. So what I simply do is I take my observable array.pipe. I add in my own map array. I say, okay, I have a number and the item that I get, the numbers that I get from my array, I multiply them by two. And that's simply, uh, that's as simple as it gets. 
So from now on, every time that I want to map a value in an array, I can simply do this, and I don't need to write this line of code here, here over and over again. I can simply do it once like this. So that's the first use case that usually occurs. Um, there's a second one, and uh, I'm going to show that right now. Another common one is that you have multiple loading states we wish to combine. Imagine that we have a application that needs to load data from several sources from an API. Like we have an amount of space shuttles that we need to get from our API. We need the arrival times of those uh, um, space shuttles. And we need the list of space stations so that we can actually connect all of these things. Um, each individual API has its own loading state. Maybe the API to get to arrival times goes relatively quickly. The ones to get the space shuttles takes a lot longer, and the one from space station takes the longest. All of these individual loading states are all observables, but we don't want to listen to each individual one. We simply want to know, are all of these loaded, or is just one of them loaded, or is still one uh, loading at the time? How would we do that? Well, I've talked about the combined latest in a few of my previous slides. And here's an actual example. I have three loading states observables. I have three Booleans. And I listen to all of them. I use a combined latest. And what I get from this combined latest is I make an array of each individual observable. So the event that I will get in my subscribe is, um, three, is an array with three Booleans in it. But I don't want an array with three booleans. What I want is one boolean that will tell me is, is there anything loading at this point or not. So let's make this into a custom operator that allows us to quickly handle this. When we use a combined latest, we get the array and we want a single boolean. Speed up our workflow, we're going to make a combined loading operator. And again, we use the same principle as last time. We're going to make a new operator and we're going to use the existing RxJS operators. So what we get as an input is simply an array of Booleans and we want a single Boolean. So what we do, we grab our loading Boolean, we check if any of them is still uh, is false, uh, if every one of them is false, and then we return. And in that way, we get a single Boolean like this. We will essentially instantly combine all these Booleans and we'll get a single Boolean, whether or not the page is loading at that point. And that makes it super easy and makes it a lot, a lot quicker to write this code. Um, so creating your own custom operators is actually very easy and very simple to do, as long as you just use the existing operators that RxJS offers and you just do some custom things. And it allows us to speed up our workflow because there are a lot of common use cases in your own project that might not be a common use case in everyone's project. Um, but custom operators allow us to basically put all that code in and repetitive implementations in one single operator that allows us to easily test them. We have all the information in one area. And most importantly, um, we can share it throughout the entire um, application. So let's continue. So we're getting to my closing thoughts. So what else is there? Um, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. This is a short presentation. I can't tell you everything that is in RxDS because it has a big learning curve. And if I would start telling everyone what every little thing about RxDS is, then I think a lot of you would just say, yeah, okay, I'll see you later because that's way too much. But I'll give you two more things to know. Um, we also have special observables. Like I told you guys that um, you can only listen to the stream, but I was kind of lying because there are special observables and I'm using parentheses because they aren't really observables that we can both listen to and push data to. Um, these are called subjects. And as I said, uh, this allows us to both listen and push data to the stream. That gives us a greater control over our streams. I like using them, and especially in Angular uh, applications, I usually end up having a bunch of them. So to give you a quick idea of what that is and how you create them, you, make, you can make a new subject, simply with a data subject. And on this subject, we can push, but we can also subscribe and listen to. Very simple. I'm not going to go way into detail how this works, for that, I refer to the documentation, but it's good that you already know that this thing exists. There's also a special subject that has its first 
initial value that we passed pass to it super easy because sometimes we want streams that start right away and not from the moment we start pushing data to it so again subjects it's not important to really know today but if you ever want to use that if you ever want to push things to the stream a subject is what you're going to have to use and um, there are also a multitude of other operators that help us with our streams like i said i've been I've been a front-end developer for almost six years now. I've been working at RxJS for about three to four years now. And I'm not a perfect being. I forget a lot of stuff. And I also forget a lot of the operators. Um, nobody knows all these operators by heart, and neither should you. You really shouldn't put in time to know all of them. The best thing to do is know that they exist and use the documentation well. That means that if you have a certain use case, know that there is an operator that might help you. And when you need it, and when you think you need that operator, go into the documentation and look for it. There's no use in trying to learn all of them by heart. There will be a few of the operators that you will be using so often that you will start to use, that you will start to learn them by heart. But in fact, the best thing is just know that they exist and use the documentation so that you can actually do things with them when you need it. There's no need to be an Einstein that knows everything. Um, it's fine to look up things from once in a while. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. And my closing thoughts are, well, should you use RxJS? And um, yeah, my answer is RxJS. Yes, use it, um, but only when you need it. So don't start using it because you don't start using it because you're like, oh, this guy with the mustache said that it was a good thing. Make sure that it fits with the use case that you're using at that point. Make sure that you, um, you're not rushing into it. Make sure that you look into the documentation, be smart about it. Um, but as especially as an Angular developer, I can really say that I couldn't work without it. Um, using Angular without RxJS is like using a computer without a computer screen. You can use a computer without a computer screen, but in the end of the day, we mostly use computers with computer screens. So if you're using <laughs> Angular, please try using, uh, please try uh, understanding and uh, learning RxJS because it really helps you with API calls, with stores, with all kinds of cool things. Um, so that's my opinion. If if I would, uh, if someone would ask me would I use it on a project, I wouldn't even doubt about it anymore. I would just use it right away because I've been using it for so long and I really, really love it. So um, that was a presentation uh, for now. I'm going to take a look at the questions in the chat. Um, so we have a map exception from Denis. Thanks uh, to my dad. <laughs> and so I, as I understand, under the hood, RxJS lips at event listeners only when we have a subscriber. And when we unsubscribe, we have no more subscription. It removes event listener automatically. Um, not exactly. Um, it will remove the um, it will remove the subscription, but I'm not entirely sure if it also removes the event listener itself. I think it does. I think it makes sense that it would, but um, I, I'm not entirely sure. It's not that you, if you unsubscribe from an observable, that your observable will stop existing. It's simply your subscription that stops um, that stops existing. So that's a good distinction to make. And um, once you stop subscribing to observable, you can always resubscribe it to it later. Kind of makes sense because you do want to be able to. Um, re-listen re to an observable. If there are any more questions, feel free to um, put that in the comment box. Um, if you don't have, to, if you have a question later on, feel free to also put it in the chat. Um, we'll keep an eye on it and I will try to answer it in the chat even when someone else is doing their presentation. Um, but I assume that I can't see anyone typing right now. I assume that there aren't any questions again if you have any other questions during the rest of the presentations feel free to simply put something in the chat if that is okay then i will pass the uh the floor to my colleague denis uh, thank you so much to all of you for listening 
And thank you so much for donating to this charity. It means a lot to us all, and it means a lot to people in Ukraine. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to do a strange setup because I can't share in Zoom uh, for some reason. So I have my laptop here and Katya's laptop here. Um, <laughs> my speaker notes are here and the presentation is there. So I'll have to press two keys, but we'll make it work. Um, so, okay. Um, the next presentation is about GraphQL. Uh, as I've said uh, before, uh, we have tried to keep everything a bit more entry level so that everyone can follow and everyone can take something uh, into their uh, into their daily workflow uh, that they can uh, that they can use. Um, so, who am I? Uh, so yeah, as I said, uh, I am a JavaScript developer and team manager at Studio Hyperdrive. I have been a developer since two thousand fourteen. Uh, in the early days, I focused on SharePoint, which, uh, thank the Lord, I, don't have, I do not have to do anymore. Um, and I am not an artist. Uh, I don't have a mustache. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what else uh, even added to his bio, <laughs> but I'm none of those things. Um, I'm also not very creative, uh, just saying. Um, so... Um, also, uh, special thanks to my colleague uh, Niels, uh, who is the person who made this workshop. Uh, who made the workshop uh, GraphQL, uh, on which this presentation is based. Um, so he is also following uh, today. Uh, and if there are any questions that uh, are beyond my capabilities, he will uh, try to answer them as well in Q and A. Um, so what is GraphQL? Um, GraphQL is two things actually. Uh, at first it's a query language for APIs, meaning that you can write and perform queries uh, towards uh, your uh, API. And on the other hand, it's a runtime that will help your API um, to provide the data that is requested through that query. Um, this is also reflected in the sense that you will need it on both backend and frontend. Um, so both on the server side as on, as on the side of your clients. Um, and aside from that, GraphQL will also describe data in your API uh, and provide models and types that give uh, clients the ability to fine tune uh, queries so that they can consume the data they need uh, in the format they need. So it allows the API to cater to the client instead of uh, letting the client cater to your API, which is a big difference, of course. Um, how did GraphQL come to existence? Uh, not by my uh, handiwork, but by the handiwork of Facebook, uh, who uh, started on it in 2012 and did an initial release in 2015. Uh, but as all uh, developer side projects uh, do, uh, they needed three years uh, to get a stable release uh, out there. Um, at least they made a stable release and didn't let it die on GitHub. Um, so it's a, <laughs> it's a specification uh, that you can use on multiple, uh, in multiple languages. Uh, there, we are uh, focusing on JavaScript, of course, at your hyperdrive, but you can also uh, implement uh, GraphQL with a Java, uh, Python, or Go backend, uh, or many others, I guess. Um, and it is currently maintained by the GraphQL Foundation, uh, which is uh, also uh, which also contains uh, members like uh, Hasura, I think, Apollo. So all the uh, maintainers are actually people who work on projects. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, something has gone wrong uh, here, but no matter. Um, so the server, uh, so we're going to talk about a few uh, upsides uh, of CraftQL after which we will talk about a few downsides, um, even if you might want to share uh, the screen here for our colleagues. 
Um, so the first upside is flexibility uh, because the server um, no longer determines which data uh, is returned to the client and in which structure and format, uh, which is something you will see in a RESTful API, uh, but not that much in GraphQL uh, APIs. Um, so as I said before, the, uh, the API caters to the client instead of backwards. Uh, as we're used to. So if I give an example, um, uh, a RESTful API uh, will have endpoints like this, uh, where you have, for example, a user model and a message model. Um, and the user model uh, will have some put, uh, get, post, delete uh, stuff on a user endpoint, and then you get a detail and maybe a delete on a user with an ID uh, and then the same for messages. So this is very verbose uh, and often set up around your database models and offering CRUD uh, operations for every model uh, through your endpoints. Um, so the user might need to fetch several things in order to build up one, uh, one specific object that it can use in the client. Um, so in this, uh, in this sense, the clients are consuming data that is catered towards uh, a public API uh, that is more generally, generally structured. Uh, but if we then look at GraphQL, we can build queries that cater to our client where we can just say, hey, I want the ID and username uh, for my user of this ID. Um, and there is an important difference here and which is pretty convenient. Uh, if, for example, you would want to fetch uh, all users for an overview, um, in the RESTful way, uh, you would be restricted to the properties that the API offers on that uh, endpoint, which is often more restricted than on detail because uh, it's a lot more data to process and send towards the uh, client. Um, whereas with uh, GraphQL, you could just say, I need uh, for my users an image, the username, and maybe something else, uh, and nothing else more, uh, but you can choose, pick and choose those fields that you, that you need. Um, so that's pretty nifty. Uh, second uh, upside is speed, um, because with a RESTful API, you would need multiple requests to render a page. Um, and every request contains all data, even the data you don't need. Uh, whereas with GraphQL, you would just send one request uh, with your query and get the, uh, the data you need uh, in a more fine gradient population. Uh, so that's convenient. Um, this, also, um, this can also happen in a RESTful situation uh, uh, where you are in charge of both backend and frontend, and there's only one client. In a more realistic scenario, you will probably cater that, uh, that API's responses to your client uh, and populate data, uh, which you normally wouldn't. Um, so that's also an option, but in more, in more public APIs or uh, APIs that offer data to multiple uh, different clients, uh, like an application and a website and something else and something else, uh, that's not something you would want to do. Uh, make that API more opinionated is, uh, is an unwanted side effect, I guess, of, uh, of working RESTful. Um, so uh, maintainability is another upside. Uh, if you would need different data in a RESTful si situation, uh, you would require code changes on both server and client side since you are manipulating uh, the model and then the controller and everything in between towards your client. Whereas with GraphQL, you, you just pick and choose uh, from your type and your model, uh, which fields you want to populate. Uh, and if those exist on the model, there's probably a big chance you can just uh, change whatever you want to get from the API. Um, upside four. Um, in real time, um, so in RESTful APIs, you don't have built-in real-time support. You would need a WebSocket implementation with uh, Pusher or Socket IO or another WebSocket uh, package, or maybe build it from scratch if you're really uh, into suffering. Um, <laughs> um, but GraphQL has built-in real-time support uh, with subscriptions. Um, that is to say, 
it, uh, GraphQL provides subscriptions uh, which are built on top of WebSocket uh, technology, um, but they don't uh, provide it completely built. Uh, you still need an external package GraphQL WebSocket, uh, which uh, you need to implement on both front end and back end so that your client can connect uh, to the API uh, using this WebSocket uh, protocol. Um, but this is a go-to solution right now. So most uh, client and service solutions uh, pick up on WebQL WebSocket and are using this uh, under the hood. So just install it and configure. It's not it's not that big of a deal, and and you'll be good to go. Um, I think I have one more thing, but I'm not sure. Okay, we'll just move on. Um, upside five, um, there's no more need for uh, additional validation, type checking, uh, etc. Uh, so in a more restful situation, we need Joy or Class Validator or something else uh, to validate the inputs towards your uh, API, like uh, headers, uh, parameters, a body on your put or post requests, or anything uh, in that, uh, or anything of that kind, um, because your API expects information to be formatted a certain way. So for example, if a parameter is, uh, is formatted wrong, uh, your get might fail because the query parameter is not as expected, or a post might fail because of an incorrect body, uh, which is also inconvenient, or in certain edge cases to make it a bit more dramatic, um, an incorrect or non-existing validation uh, could, pro uh, could cause problems uh, towards your data, uh, where you could uh, probably overwrite uh, one or more properties uh, on your model through a put uh, than you had uh, a couple of more than you had anticipated, potentially breaking relations or data, uh, which is not uh, that convenient. Uh, not saying that's happened to me, but uh, <laughs> at least it wasn't in production. Um, <laughs> so with GraphQL, this works a bit less for both. Uh, thanks to built-in validation and type checking. Uh, if, for example, I were to properly define my user model, uh, GraphQL will validate my queries, mutations, etc., uh, and fail when uh, they don't match my types. So that's uh, a bit more easy to work with. Then self-documenting. Uh, no, bygone are the days of writing uh, Swagger or Open API docs in uh, comments in your controller files. Uh, <laughs> GraphQL will take care of that uh, for you if you are uh, correctly documenting your types and models. Uh, everything should be taken care of. Um, an additional bonus is that uh, often uh, the server solutions like Prisma or Hasu Hasuna, Hasua, I always confuse the name, um, offer the, the playground as well. So you can play around uh, with queries before implementing them on your client. Um, so that's a lot of good news, uh, <laughs> but there are also some downsides. Uh, for example, there is no built-in support for file uploads or downloads, uh, which is something you'll have to use old tactics for, uh, as to say. Um, there is no built-in support for web caching, uh, although I'll have to make the side note that the Apollo client does offer in-memory caching, uh, so you can, you can kind of have caching. If you want to, uh, I, I think they have a recommended setup that, that includes it as well. Um, and there are limits to the complexity of queries, of course. Uh, you can do whatever you want until you can't do any more. Uh, <laughs> so that's that. Um, so use cases, um, where would we use GraphQL uh, over, or where would we choose to use GraphQL over RESTful? Uh, if we would need different data um, of the same entities for multiple clients, like I said, if, we, if you have a website, a mobile application, uh, or multiple pages where you have the same data, but you want different properties or you want formatting to be a little bit different or populated properties, uh, this is more convenient. Um, if you have nested data for a single page, for example, if you have your user, but you also want his 20 latest messages and uh, all the channels he's joined or created, um, then that would be more convenient in a GraphQL uh, setup as you can just populate whatever you want uh, on that user and you'll get it in return instead of doing three uh, API calls 
towards three different endpoints. And if you need real-time support, it's also a bit more convenient that you have the sockets uh, included uh, instead of having to build that functionality yourself based on a solution like socket IO and then having to maintain it as well. Uh, so there is that. Uh, we also have this uh, image or table or whatever you want to call it of uh, sort of cheat sheet. When do I use GraphQL or REST? Uh, that we've uh, found from Altex Soft. I have included the source uh, to the page where, uh, the, where more information about this can be found. Uh, if you want to uh, read up on that, you can always do so. It's a good resource. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I won't reinvent the wheel after that. Um, so uh, about GraphQL, because we've seen some upsides, downsides in theory, uh, but uh, what is GraphQL in uh, technical terms? So GraphQL consists of uh, three key functionalities. You can query, you can mutate, and you can subscribe. Um, and if we have a look at a query at first, uh, why would we use queries? Well, uh, to fetch data. Um, thanks. <laughs> I'm forgetting the two buttons. Okay, um, to fetch data. Um, so in if you would compare it to RESTful API, this would kind of replace the get or head calls uh, where you just get data uh, from your API. Um, and in a query, you can also determine which data is returned by the server. So you can manipulate which fields you want uh, and what you want to populate uh, in the response. So if we have a look at a query, uh, we'll see, uh, we'll have something like this, where you have a query keywords and then the brackets and inside you see the channel with the channel ID, which in this case is uh, a number static, but in a more realistic scenario, that would be a variable. And then we define which fields of our channel we want populated uh, in response, which is in our case, the ID name description, and then we populate the ID username for our creator and the ID text edited, et cetera, for our messages. And as you can see, the creator, the messages, and the author in the message are all uh, from different models. In our case, the author and creator are from our user model uh, and the message from our message model. So we are already populating data uh, from related uh, models in our database uh, in one simple query instead of having to do multiple requests or make our uh, RESTful API more opinionated. If we then, uh, if we then move to mutate uh, or mutations, uh, then we'll see um, that uh, a mutation can be used to mutate our data or create data uh, for that matter, or even delete it. So it kind of uh, replaces our, uh, post push, uh, our post put or patch or even delete calls, if you would compare it to RESTful API. Um, and also in this uh, mutation, you can also define which uh, fields you want populated in the return. So if you, for example, create a user, you can define which fields of that new user you want to have uh, in return. So if we then move to our example, um, our mutation here will create a new message uh, containing a data, which is an object. Uh, and in that object, we can find the text of our message and which channel to post it in, which is our ID. And then after the create message, you can see that we all, uh, uh, that we again have those brackets with an ID, but we could also have uh, text and channel uh, uh, or whatever populated in that return object as well. In this case, we just want the ID. Subscriptions, um, this is where it really gets cool. Um, so subscriptions uh, can watch data changes um, and it replaces, uh, I'm using air quotes because it doesn't really replace WebSocket uh, as an entire functionality, but it replaces the need for a uh, custom in implementation on top of WebSocket uh, by being built in. Um, and also with a subscription, you can again uh, define which data you will need. So if we then have a look at a subscription, uh, you can see the subscription keyword again, the brackets, and then messages, uh, which is what we want, our model. Um, at first, uh, the first property is a mutation, um, which will uh, be a populated version of uh, what mutation you have uh, done. 
uh, so that you can have an indication if your user was created or updated or something else. Uh, and then the node is the actual object uh, that you want to uh, populate. So in our case, this is the message itself where we want the ID text uh, if the message has been edited and then the author, etc. So that's that. Um, I did have a demo of this, but I'm unable to demo in Zoom uh, for some reason. Um, I will try to record my demo uh, tomorrow and provide it with the presentation. So if you want, uh, you can have a look at it uh, later on. Um, but I'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> Just imagine you've seen this amazing demo of subscriptions and messages appearing and, uh, and we'll move on. Um, so um, I, I've said a lot about types and models and, and GraphQL, but how do you define them? Well, GraphQL presents you with a few uh, types uh, for your data, um, an ID, string, boolean, integer, floats, um, and these can be used to uh, define certain properties on your uh, models. Um, at some point, you'll uh, come across an exclamation mark, um, and it's kind of a good question what that exclamation mark uh, does. Uh, you'll be inclined to never put it there or always put it there without knowing what it is. Um, so <laughs> we'll tell you right away. Um, so by default, all types in GraphQL are nullable, which mean they are, uh, which means they are allowed to be null. Um, but for some certain use cases, you want uh, you want those values to be uh, filled in. For example, if you pass an argument uh, for an ID. You don't want that ID to be null or your request will fail and no uh, response will be given. So um, the exclamation mark <coughs> notes uh, that type as being uh, non-nullable, which is kind of strange, non-nullable, but whatever. Um, so um, to put that in a more visual uh, example, um, in the first example, user ID is allowed to be null. So as you can see, the user ID is a string and there is no exclamation mark. You can leave it empty. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that, but you can. Uh, whereas in the second uh, example, the user ID is not allowed to be null uh, because we have that exclamation mark with the string uh, implying that uh, you need to fill something in. And then we move on to variables. Um, so, as I've said before, uh, with, for example, the uh, message ID uh, in, the, in one of the query examples, um, those are static, but that's not really what we want to do. Uh, we want to get details from certain uh, IDs that we've uh, received throughout our app uh, or mutate certain data based on its ID or even fill in uh, text on that message that comes from our app. So, we will want to use uh, variables in our queries, mutations, and subscriptions, uh, which is not that hard to do. You can just provide uh, arguments to your mutation or query or subscription, whatever, um, and then use those variables inside your query. It's as easy as that. Um, and then we'll round up with GraphQL clients because there's one more important thing to say. Um, if you want to use GraphQL in your front end, uh, you could use something like Apollo or GraphQL request, which is probably recommended because they add uh, added, added functionality uh, and it's more convenient to do so because they plug in really well to the GraphQL process. Uh, but if you just want to try something out, you can also use uh, plain fetch with a post request. Uh, that's kind of all you need to get going. Uh, so there's also that uh, might be handy to know if you want to go experiment uh, later on. Um, but if you choose uh, for the GraphQL uh, client uh, way, then you'll probably come across something like this. Um, this example is with GraphQL request, which is a lightweight library. Uh, if you use React, you'll uh, probably use GraphQL client, uh, Apollo client. Uh, I think Apollo, Apollo also has a view implementation, which is currently in beta, I think. I'm not that sure. Um, and there is also an Apollo Angular uh, in the works or already done, uh, which is also pretty cool. Uh, but in this uh, example, we'll keep it simple. So at first we'll set up a new GraphQL client, um, which is 
pretty much like you would do with, for example, Axios uh, in a more uh, conventional code base. Um, and then we'll define a query, uh, the get channels and get messages, after which we'll just use our GraphQL client to request those uh, queries. Um, you can also note that the queries have been used, uh, the queries uh, are wrapped in a template literal tag, uh, GQL. This is uh, um, a, yeah, a template literal tag that is offered by an external library, but most GraphQL clients will export this as well, so you don't have to uh, provide it on your own. And that's kind of it, because the small demo uh, is no demo at this point. <laughs> But I'll try to record it tomorrow and, uh, and provide it with my presentation for those uh, who are interested. There you go. I think we can stop sharing. Okay. There is someone in the chat who said something or asked something or not. No, okay, no questions. Well, same as even if you do have questions, just ask them uh, and we'll try to answer them before the meetup is done. Clint Diesel has joined. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to the last presentation, which is um, testing with Cypress or end-to-end -end testing with Cypress, which is a testing tool. But first, let me introduce myself just like all the others. So my name is Katja. I'm a front-end developer at Studio Hyperdrive. And I have around five years of experience. Um, I worked for three years at Studio Hyperdrive as a developer. And before that, um, I worked in a creative agency. Um, I know some things about React, React Native, Angular, Vue, and so on. But my focus is mostly on creative development, which is uh, 3GS or WebGL, page transitions, animations, and so on. Um, but I'm a little bit careless uh, about the code I deliver, and that's why I started to uh, learn more about testing, uh, because I don't like manual tests, so that's why I started to learn about automatic testing, and that's what we are going to talk about today. Uh, first, let's have a look at the three main types of testing. Uh, the first one is unit testing. You might have heard of unit testing. Uh, a very popular tool to do unit testing is Chest. Um, unit testing is mostly for developers as it tests a small piece of code. For example, if you have a component, um, for example, a button, you can test that component with a unit test. Um, so it has a small piece of logic and it's especially interesting for big applications because if you want uh, to refactor your application along the way, then you're more um, sure about your refactored code that it will work or that it will still work. Uh, so that's about unit testing. So unit testing is mostly for developers um, and not to test um, user use cases. Another kind of test is integration testing that's uh, more or less similar to unit testing, uh, but it's more to test uh, bigger workflows or bigger pieces of code. For example, a page that has several, um, several components that are connected to a store or something like that. And then we have end-to-end -end testing. So what about end-to-end -end testing? End-to-end -end testing is testing like a real user would use your application. Uh, so you don't think like a developer, you think more uh, like a user would use your application, uh, just like you create user stories um, if you start an HR sprint. So end-to-end -end testing, um, not only developers benefit from end-to-end -end testing, actually the whole team uh, benefits from end-to-end -end testing. So the project manager, developers, the q &A team, everyone can benefit from it. Uh, because it's automated and it tests just like someone else uh, without a technical background to test or use your application. So let's have a look at the advantages of end-to-end -end testing. First of all, it reduces the testing time as every test will go automatically and otherwise you would do it manually. You would manually uh, click through your application. Uh, it also improves the uh, quality assurance because you can add as many tests as you want and it will always test the same uh, scenes. It also improves the stability of your app. And like I said, it tests real life actions, 
real life use cases, just like a user would use your application. There are also a few disadvantages. First of all, the tests take a little more time to finish compared to unit testing. And like I said, um, it's not made for developers. So if you write bad code and that code still works, the test uh, can succeed. So it will not test your code. It will just test the output. And if the output works as, as expected, then your test will succeed. So let's take a look at Cypress. So uh, you probably uh, heard of Cypress IO. So Cypress IO is a JavaScript based front end testing tool that also runs in the browser, which means you can test your application in several browsers, just like Chrome, Firefox, or Edge. Um, and it's JavaScript based. So if you're very used to write JavaScript, the syntax of Cypress will be very, um, very comfortable for you. Let's have a look at the advantages of Cypress. So Cypress runs very fast. You will see it in the demo later. Um, it's cross browsers. So you can also add more visual tests or design tests. Um, it's very easy to write tests because um, yeah, the syntax is very straightforward. Um, you can even guess the syntax if you want to. It's universal. It's also very easy to debug. I will show that later uh, because Cypress adds an application to your device and you can use that application or that browser to go back in time in this test and to check where it went wrong or where the test fails. And you can also use the console to uh, debug, uh, but more about that later. Um, like I said, you can also do visual testing. So you can do uh, design tests in Cypress uh, which is uh, pretty hard to do in unit testing because it's just code and nothing else. Um, and uh, in Cypress, you can do unit testing, integration tests, and end-to-end -end testing all in one tool. But today we will focus on the end-to-end -end testing part. So here's a small video, video of how fast Cypress actually works. Uh, I will show this demo later today. Uh, but as you can see, I wrote I don't know, 15 tests. And in a few minutes, um, Cypress already did those tests. And as you can see, it works like a real user. It just fills in the form like a real user would do that pretty fast and automatically. So this is the Cypress, um, this is the Cypress browser um, that is installed on your device, but you can also run these tests in a pipeline. For example, GitLab pipelines or Bitbucket pipelines. Um, and that way you can test on development environments, um, exception environments, production environments, anywhere you want to test your application. Let's take a look at a few disadvantages. So currently there is no support for Safari and Internet Explorer. So if you want to do cross browser testing, you can still not do all the browsers automatically. And it can also uh, run one browser at a time. Um, so it cannot run two browsers asynchronously. So let's take a look at a few examples and how Cypress really works uh, when you want to use it in your project. So if you install Cypress, it will install a folder in your root. Um, and this folder already contains a few examples, which are pretty useful because you can just copy paste a few complex uh, situations. So let's have a look at the Cypress folder structure. So there is a folder called fixtures. You will come back to that later, but fixtures are some kind of snippets you can use in your, um, no, are um, some kind of mock data you can use in your tests. Uh, then you have a folder called integration. So in this folder, you will add all your tests and there are already a few examples, like I said, local storage, cookies, and so on. You can just copy paste those examples if you need them to. There's also a folder called plugin if you want to install plugin. And there is also a folder called support to add comments. And um, yeah, I confused that with fixtures. So comments are some kind of snippets you can use, but more about that later. Um, so let's take a look at a test file example. This is uh, a test file. You can add a name to your uh, test or more uh, general name. For example, if you want to test a page, you can add page uh, home. 
Um, and then you have, uh, for example, for, before each function, which runs before each test. And then you have uh, a list of all your tests, which you can also give a name. So like I said, you can also use comments. Comments are small pieces of code that um, are repetitive, so that come back uh, from time to time. A good example is authentication. So for example, if you want to test authenticate, authenticated parts of your application, you can just um, add a comment uh, login, for example, you can visit the login page, you can fill in the login form, and then you're uh, logged in. Um, and you can um, use this comment in your tests. So here I added a comment called navigate to login. And if you want to use it, you can just call this as a function. So ci.navigate to login. And in this case, it will run before each test. So let's say, take a closer look at visual testing. Um, the thing you probably use the most is selecting an item and checking if it is visible or not. For example, um, you can use the ci.get. This get is just like a query selector. So you can select an element by class, by ID, or even by tag name. Um, but the most uh, recommended way to select an item is to add a data attribute called data uh, dash CI, and then you can add um, an ID for your test. So for example, if you test a component called notification, you can add notification as an identifier. So if you select that element, you can call should be visible just to check if this element is visible in the scene. You also have other things like defined or something. So visible really means you can see it. So second of all, you can also test certain CSS. For example, you can select a button. You can check if there is CSS called border radius and if it equalizes four pixels. So that way you can also uh, do more um, styling related tests. You can, you can also do responsive testing. So for example, you can add the viewport or you can set the viewports uh, of Cypress. There are a few predefined viewports, for example, iPhones. You can say if it's landscape or not, or you can just add a width or a height, and that way you can test your application on desktop, mobile, and so on. Um, so that's how you can test different devices or viewports. Um, another thing I want to show you is events. Um, I think you use events a lot, especially click events, but you even you even have more uh, events in Cypress if you check the documentation. So just like um, the other examples, you can select something. It's better to do it with a data attribute. You can click on it, just uh, call the click function. So it's pretty straightforward syntax. And then you can check if something appears, for example, a message. Like I said, um, you cannot check if a function is called when you click on something. You really have to check something visually, just like a user would see something on the screen if he clicks on a button. You do not have to think like a developer would think. You have to think like a user would think. You can also test if, you, uh, if your navigation works very well. So you can select a link that contains a certain text, in this case, contact. You click on it and then you can check if the location is changed to contact. So that way you can check uh, the navigation or you can check if a form is filled in, if it's redirected to the right page. So then, we, uh, then I want to show you some things about forms. Uh, also, this syntax is very straightforward and I think you uh, test forms a lot if you write uh, certain applications instead of websites. Uh, so for example, if you want to test a certain text field or uh, an input field, you can select it. You can type in it. In this case, I type the word example. I unselect it and then I check if this input field has a certain value, for example, example. Um, so that's very easy. Also the syntax is pretty easy because it's just type. 
Um, also, selecting a drop down is pretty sta straightforward. You select a drop down, you select a certain option just by calling the select function, and then you check if the drop down has a certain value. In this case, the value is developer because I selected the option developer. Also, for radio buttons, that's pretty straightforward. You select a certain radio button, you click on it, and then you check if it's checked or not checked. Um, and the same goes for checkboxes. You click on it and then you check if it's checked, or you can check if a certain check mark or SVG image uh, appears on the screen. Next, uh, I want to talk about API calls. Just so, uh, just like I said, you test it like a user, and a user doesn't care if you use a certain store or if you use a certain ar architecture in your application. So what you want to do is to manipulate API calls. Um, for example, to make sure that the API returns something uh, you want to, uh, for example, a certain name. Um, and if you add it to user in the uh, API, that is still, that your test still uh, works. So um, let's have a look how you can manipulate certain response. So you have the CI. Uh, intercept function, and then you can uh, select a certain API call. In this case, it's a get API call to the certain URL called API URL.com. Um, we manipulate the response by adding a fixture. So a fixture is stored in a fixture folder and it's just a JSON file. Actually, you can just return whatever you want, but probably you will just mock your API and you will um, add fixed, uh, fixed values to certain items. Um, and you give a name to this interception, it's fetch API, and then you wait if the API uh, call happens before you go further in your tests. So here is a more clear example. For example, uh, it's the example of the demo I will show you later. So you visit the to-dos page, you intercept a certain um, call, you add a fixture to it, and you wait until the API call is done. Um, later on, you will see that I just want to test if four items are returned. Uh, so this is the example of the fixtures. So in fixtures folder, I added a todos.json, which is an array with todos. You can also um, send uh, post calls or do uh, requests in your um, Cypress testing. Um, that this might be useful if you just want to log in without doing the user um, gestures. So for example, you can do a post call to a user um, API URL and you can add uh, a body to it. So that way you can also do requests instead of manipulating the API. So yeah, now I will show you a little demo. Um, so here is a, a little page I made with React. Let's go to the home page. Um, it has a button, uh, a small list with a few items. It also has a form on, an, on another page with an input field, a uh, drop down, um, radio buttons, and a check mark. Those are all the examples I showed you in the presentation. And there is also an API page which fetches a few um, things from the API. So I have this, this running at localhost uh, 3000. I will show you some things uh, about my code. So here is the root folder. It's like I said, a React application with components, uh, with a small store, uh, with some pages, the home, the form, and the API page. And then we have a folder called Cypress in here. I also have um, a JSON file, cypress.json, and here I can set the URL. So I'm running this locally, but you can test anything you want. You even can test Facebook or Google if you want. So that's what I mean, that you can also run your tests on an exception environment, a production environment, anything you want. Um, if you run it in pipelines, just make sure that you run this uh, application as well in the pipelines and then do your tests if you want to run it locally in the pipeline. So like I said, we have a Cypress folder here. Um, 
downloads is uh, nothing, I guess. We have a fixtures uh, folder with to-dos in it, just like I showed you. So this is a JSON file uh, that I intercept from the API. I have an integration folder and I have the uh, support folder with a small comment to uh, intercept this API, just like I showed you in the presentation. Um, and those are just examples that come back to the presentation, but I will send it to you um, together with the uh, presentation. So have a look at um, the Cypress testing. So like I said, I run this on localhost 3000, and now I'm going to open the Cypress uh, browser. So this uh, opens a small uh, browser on your device. And here you have an overview of all the tests. These are just the files uh, like you see in my um, rep repository. Um, and here you can also select a certain um, browser if you want to. You can also add it to the comment and it will open the browser you uh, like to test in. Uh, by default, it's Chrome. And if you click on running these tests, um, it will open the uh, Cypress browser and it will run all these tests very quickly. It's not as quickly in, in, as in a video, but still it's pretty quickly. And like I said, it's very easy to debug because you can click on a certain test and you can just see um, what the machine or what is Cypress doing automatically for you. In this case, it selects a certain uh, radio button. Um, and that way it's easy to debug because you can just go back in history. You can also inspect this element. So you have the console, uh, you can see if some errors are uh, popping up and so on. So that's why Cypress is really easy to use and really easy to debug compared to chess because you can just go back in time and you can see at what point your tests uh, will fail. Um, so yeah, that's about it. I will check uh, the chat if there are any questions. Um, if there are still any questions for Eben or for Denny, you can still ask them and we will answer them um, for you. So thank you for listening to all our presentations. Um, and I hope uh, you are inspired to use RxJS, to use uh, GraphQL and to use Cypress. Um, so I see there are a few questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> Denise is answering but, them. In uh, the, um... But elaborate if, if needed, if I'm not uh, clear enough. <laughs> yeah, so I see Ilya ah, okay, has a question about Cypress working in a pipeline. Um, so yeah, it is uh, a Docker container that runs in this pipeline and that will run um, or that spins up your application and then it will run the Cypress um, browser. Um, so you don't need a cloud solution, but you can also um, deploy your Cypress um, or you can also deploy your application and then you can also run Cypress in a pipeline and then it will not run um, yeah, locally, but it's easier if you just um, run it in a pipeline or run it locally, because if you do changes along the way and it's not deployed, then Cypress um, is still updated. And does it have TypeScript, TypeScript support? I'm not sure. Oh, Denise says uh, it has TypeScript support. Yeah, yeah. I've been running it with TypeScript as well. Okay, we already use it with TypeScript, so. There we go. I think that concludes our uh, our presentation. Diana, uh, I think we'll pass the word back to you. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, you can also uh, add them later to, uh, to my letter. So I will forward them to our speakers or you can uh, find our speaker in social media, you can ask as well. Uh, I just want to tell thank you, thank you to our really cool speakers for this 
speeches, cool speeches. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope uh, our speakers, Denny, Simon, Katya, you also enjoyed it. And we really did great work. Uh, and for those people who came here today and spent uh, more than one hour together, also thank you that you found the time to uh, find new information for yourself, to develop a bit and I hope it will help you. Um, that's it. You, as I told, uh, I will send you the recording and I will send you uh, all additional information if needed and hope to see you again on other meetings and uh, just have a nice evening, the rest of the evening and uh, see you guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. bye.